So I think, yes, we're live. Very good. Live. So, <laughs> um, Miguel, thank you Hi. very much for joining me uh, oh, in our first um, exploration into um uh, into the first, into the fourth, no, actually the third pillar, I've got so many in my mind, mm -hmm. um, on this project. So as we know, um, for those who have been watching and um, we've been spending this uh, pandemic uh, as an opportunity to go deep into our work at um, the, so the Global Theater Project and really look at this theater for social renewal work what we call theater for social renewal and the basis of that being a foundation of four pillars. And the first we've gone into uh, really in depth was very interesting conversation into kindness. And then the second community. And the third we're entering into now with you for the first time is artistry. Mm. Um, and then the fourth is called the seven whole artist elements. And that one contains seven values um, really that we as theater artists engage with almost naturally sometimes, but that we can offer to our fellow community members as a way to tap into themselves as more whole uh, artists. So when we get back to the question of artistry, um, for me, there's also a progression really. So we start with kindness um, toward ourselves and towards others and towards um, our communities. And then we start to look at that word community and what we found in these discussions is that they're really complex, they're deep uh, and layered discussions. Um, what, uh, what I see is that when, when we move from kindness to community to artistry, artistry really contains in some senses, um, uh, at least in our work, that kindness and that community. So, what I am interested in from the perspective of the Global Theater Project, when we look at artistry, is that the question is how can artists raise their own artistry and at the same time inspire artistry in others? Mm -hmm. I, I go back to looking at them, some research I was doing, um, reading Lewis Mumford, who wrote about societal structures. And um, he was talking about utopians and how at certain points in human development, we lived in societies where people were containing both artistry and science in themselves and offering that to the community. So there wasn't a separation of artists here and scientists there. Mm -hmm. There was a real integration of the artistry of a person or the science curiosity of a person into the communal benefit of the whole. And so this is, um, what I'm interested in, how could we bring back, if, if we work to build healthier communities that are really almost successful villages in the sense that we live together, we know each other, we care about each other and we contribute, what happens if the artists, the professional artists, give of themselves, give their, their tricks and their passion and their you know, a doorway to those who consider themselves not artists, so that those people can tap into their, their innate ability, their innate creativity, so that the world could actually benefit from their experience and expression being more whole and expansive. So that's kind of where I'm living with the work that we're doing these days. And mm -hmm. the reason that I wanted to talk to you um, and bring you in, and I'm so excited that you're my number one on the artistry uh, foundation is because, <laughs> is because, Me? yes, you, Miguel Perez, <laughs> you have won the prize. So, oh. <laughs> is because um, I, I'm interested in creating these sort of modules focusing on different um, uh, areas of expression, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know my friend Lisa is going to come and talk about flower arranging, right? Mm. So there's all different ways for artistic expression and in both a professional life and in uh, just a personal experience that then we can find how it complements our world, even if we never pursue it as a career. And um, mm. so I'm hoping to create these opportunities for people to pop in and hear something from specialists in certain areas that are artists uh, um, of years of experience. And that's why uh, I've started this, this project and was really excited to talk 
about artistry to finally get here. So I'm here mm -hmm. with you. Wow. Um, okay. I want to talk first of all about your experience um, with Shakespeare, because that is, in fact, I will write this out. We're talking <laughs> about Shakespeare and I'm going to put it right there. So <laughs> I want to hear your experience of Shakespeare and anything that you'd like to say about that. Um, and then we'll see if you answer the first question I sent you or if I'll ask oh. it separately. And it's fine. Yeah. You, you talk as you want and I'm going to be quiet now. Oh, huh. OK. Um, Shakespeare. Yes. Well, Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, I, I, my experience with Shakespeare has ever been, it's always been positive. It's always been lovely. It's, it's always been um, enlightening. And as, as uh, my first Shakespeare play, I was, I was just a, a very young man. I was like 19 years old, 18 years old, playing the the wounded sergeant in, in the Scottish play. And I, I, I had no idea what I was doing, it, what I was doing, but it was an opportunity to be loud and passionate. And, and it was an opportunity to, to sort of take, take, Shakespeare is an opportunity to take your, your humanity and, and turn it to 11, you know, to, uh, yeah to go all out as a human being. Um, someone once said, I don't know who it was, and I, I, it might have been me, but uh, I doubt <laughs> it. But someone, someone once said that, that the, the Shakespeare canon is, is the instruction book for being a person. Hmm. Um, and you, 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 you see familiar people, you hear familiar voices, um, in, in throughout the canon, there are there are people who pop up throughout all of these plays that that are just familiar to us. And it's because Shakespeare, for whatever reason, he and his company, they were attuned to to um, to human beings. Uh, Shakespeare was was a bit of an outlier in that uh, he he really wasn't all that interested in, in kings and gods and. Uh, uh, noble people. He was interested in shepherds and, you know, wenches working in in uh, taverns, you know, like the tavern in Eastcheap and Henry the Fourth. He was interested in um, in grooms and uh, and young people in love. Uh, he did, he wasn't interested in in creating a an elevated theater. He he was doing something very human, and I think. I, who knows? I'm not a Shakespeare scholar. I'm just a player. But I, I think a lot of it had to do with that he could, with, with having those kind of characters, he could get a lot more people into the theater, especially down front. You can get a lot of people in there for a penny. And uh, he, was, he was about putting butts in the seats. So he, he knew his audience was interested in seeing themselves on stage and seeing things that they understood on stage. So there would be clown scenes, there would be, you know, pastoral scenes and people kind of just much lower on the, on, uh, on the class ladder, the class ladder that still exists in England. Um, they, they get to see themselves up there. And yes, the more noble people, they got to hear the elevated language and they got to see politics and they got to see, you know, princes and kings and princesses. But, um, so he, he managed to speak to a much broader audience. And I think in order to do that, he, he found the nature of, of, of people and, uh, and he put it up on stage. Um, and and, and that, that, that idea exists to this day. I mean, if I were to, to, if I were to talk to my colleagues, and I, I sometimes I've talked to my colleagues and sometimes my students about, about understanding Shakespeare better, I would um, I would advise them to not look at a particular play. You, you can't really get a sense of Shakespeare from looking at the, the the tragedy of King John, and you really can't get a true sense of Shakespeare by looking at Midsummer Night's Dream. But if you look at the entire canon, and 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 not as literature, but you know, if you if you read through out loud the entire canon, you'll start to see human patterns. 
you'll start to see that uh, that Benedict, uh, Beatrice in, in uh, Much Ado About Nothing has a, has a, a cousin in, um, in uh, Katerina from uh, Taming of the Shrew. And you'll also see that those two female characters have another cousin in, uh, in Jaquies from uh, As You Like It. And, you, and, and then you have to remember that, that, these, that one actor may have been playing Katarina and playing uh, Beatrice and playing Jaquies and playing Touchstone. And being a man. And being a yeah, and being a man, you know, which which all of a sudden I it, it, I realized I realized early on that it, it didn't matter uh, what what speech what well, if it was a man's speech or, or a female speech, it it's 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 a speech, it's a human speech. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, early on in my career, I when I was auditioning for Shakespeare companies and trying to get on stage, I stopped differentiating. I I I. I I started doing whatever speech sounded good. And some, one time it was the Katarina speech from the closing of, uh, of Taming of the Shrew, you know, because it's just a, just a rip snorter of a good monologue. And why can't I get to do that monologue? Of course I can. A man was the first person to play that part, you know? And uh, I was just involved in a, in a, in a production of, um, of, with a production company I just say called uh, the show must go online. They they do Shakespeare online via Zoom, and once a week they do a different uh, play in the canon. And I watched this amazing actor, this female actor, Kristen Kristen Amberley, but she was playing um, she was playing Talbot in Henry the Sixth, and oh my God, she. Pour the paint off the walls. She was amazing. <laughs> she was full of life, and it, it never occurred to anyone to say, "Oh gosh, a female playing Talbot." Oh, she was absolutely splendid. And but 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 there it is again. You know, that Talbot, the character of Talbot, has uh, a cousin in the character of 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 Prince Hal, Henry V. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 there's no way I can prove it. I, there may be scholars who can go into all of the books and figure it out, but I know in my heart that the same actor who played Talbot played Henry V. I just know it. You can the rhythms, the the character himself. It's just. But that's when you start to really get a sense of Shakespeare. When you look at the canon from from high above, and look at the connective tissue, the the the. The, the connective tissue of humanity that that makes all of these characters, um, no matter what the play, you see the it, it makes them all real, you know. And I think that might come that might come from the fact that that Shakespeare was writing for a company. He he had a company of players. Some some. You know, they were called the King's Men at one point. I forget there was another. He had another company uh, that played at the Black's Fires. But um, but he was writing for a company. He he had a company of actors. He knew what their strengths were. He knew what their weaknesses were. He knew he was funny. He knew who was heroic. He knew who was tragic, and he, he wrote things that fit them. And you start to see that as you look at the at the canon. And when you when you're able to compare different characters that are that have a, a connectedness within the canon, then you can look outside of the particular play you're doing in Shakespeare to find other nuance, other ideas, other approaches to this character. Because because if you're playing if if you're playing Hamlet. Then you've also you've also got to look at Coriolanus, you know. You 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 cannot. You have to do that, only because there's once again there's that I feel that connective tissue. So to all my to all my colleagues who are really interested in doing Shakespeare, I would say that the entire canon is source 
is a source of, is a resource for you, for reference and for um, for finding your way, but uh, but also your heart because um, this Shakespeare just managed to really touch on what it's like to be a person. So, you, there's a lot I want to ask you about. Hmm. Um, first of all, I had never heard that before. What? Looking at the whole canon. Oh. Uh, yeah. To when you're working on one piece, on one role. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really amazing uh, invitation. Um, I really do. I think oh, that's yeah. really interesting. But not only in terms of prep preparing for the role, I also think it's interesting just to enlarge yourself as a human being, yeah. you know. But then um, you've also said a few things that I, I wrote down. Um, and uh, and I want to ask you this question, the or these questions maybe, mm -hmm. within the context of the world we live in today. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got Shakespeare out there writing as an outlier. Mm -hmm. or, or writing for, you know, he was an outlier, you said, right? So he's mm -hmm. writing for the common man. And maybe it was totally mercenary because he knew that there were more <laughs> of them and they had lots of pennies that they cobbled <laughs> together so they could give it to him and he would be able to buy, you know, a panini uh, when he went to mm -hmm. Italy to do more research. <laughs> so, um, so, but regardless of that, th there's something there he could write to, right? Which maybe mm -hmm. goes back to when you said, you see it, or, or somebody said, it's an instruction book for being a person, right? Mm -hmm. For being a person. So I'm curious to know, what do you mean by an instruction book for being a person? Like, what's a person? I think a, a person, what is a person? Maybe I chose my words wrong. Maybe I should have said an instruction book for being a human being. Well, okay, but, <laughs> but then what's, way, a, what's a human being? I'm not gonna, human I'm being? not going to let you escape because <laughs> okay, I'm, no. I'm curious what, of what what's you a might. human being. Yeah, I think I, a human being that we need an instruction book for. That we need an instruction book for. I think <sighs> if you take a child or a group of children. At least this is what William Golding tells us. If you take a, a child or a group of children, you put them on an island without any sort of a, a model to follow or any sort of adult supervision, they will they will be they will become savages, or they or their their savage nature will come forth. I think a, a person, a human being, who follows the the instructions of Shakespeare or the or the the example that Shakespeare gives us is someone who is a stakeholder in, in civilization, in, in society, someone who, who understands that there are consequences for actions, there are reactions for actions. There are behaviors that will earn you praise, and then there are other behaviors that will earn you uh, just tremendous uh, criticism, and, and other behaviors that will, that will earn you death. Um, a person who's read the instruction book, the Shakespearean instruction book for being a human being or a person, knows that, um, that love isn't always isn't always requited, you know, knows that, um, that a parent can have a tremendous um, effect on the rest of your life, you know? knows that, uh, that um, ambition, naked ambition will almost always end in, uh, in destruction, um, knows that, that, that hating another person just for hates, uh, just for the sake of hating, is is folly. Um, I, I I I think uh, also that, that that that's what those are the things that you learn. And 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 a person who's who knows all of these things, who has been at least given an introduction to these notions, I think becomes a 
a civilized human being, um, a Renaissance person. Um, and what is a Renaissance person? I think a Renaissance person is, is someone who just, who's interested in the many things and has ad adeptness in a lot of other things than just a one specialty, you know? Um, so yes, I I, I think a human being is is someone who who is either experienced directly or indirectly uh, the, the cause and effect of of human behavior in society, and um, and res and has has taken a lesson from from so, that experience. So that all is a great answer. <laughs> it's, I mean, I could try to say, oh, let's unpack that even further, but, <laughs> yeah. um, and maybe this next question will do some mm. of that. Taking what you just said, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which is one of the two really fabulous things that you've introduced today. Um, in the world in which we live today, mm -hmm. okay, January 24th, 2020, today, mm -hmm. why is performing Shakespeare important valuable or impactful? Why? Um, for the average, for, for, for the people that are the outliers, Miguel, for the people that, that are not the professional actors, not for those of us who are sitting at home hungering to get back mm -hmm. on stage, but for, our, for, the, for the world in which we live, which is not the world Shakespeare lived in, well, what does he have to offer us today? I mean, he, he continues to offer us things today. Uh, I mean, the, all those all those Star Trek fans out there know, uh, even if they don't know, they they've been introduced to Shakespeare time and time again. Um, you know, we what's important about Shakespeare today to just an everyday person is well. Like I, I was, like I was saying about the instruction book, and I mean Shakespeare's stories um, deal with with the real problems of 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 living and of living the real problems of living. Uh, today, Shakespeare's stories, a lot of them, tell us the real problem. Tell us about the real problems of racism. Uh, you know, the Othello. I mean, we can just sit there. We can just do a production of Othello today, and they're listening to Rodrigo and Iago talk about about Othello. The the, ah, the thick lips. Do you think the thick lips will try to return? You know, ah, you know, the old black ram is tucking your white you. Yes, yeah, a black man is 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 trying to get your white daughter. You know that. I'm sorry. That's 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 an issue that we're dealing with today. You know, um, the, uh, Merchant of Venice. You know these, the you know, Antonio and these other people in in Venice. You know, and, and, uh, hating Shylock, but taking his money anyway. But taking his money, taking the money he lends, but still just speaking poison about him. And of course, Shylock's incensed, and he wants to get some kind of revenge because they they deny him his own humanity. An issue that we're contending with today, um, you know, uh, the, an easy one. You know, the gang warfare, young people killing each other in the streets for, for what? You know, that that's Romeo and Juliet. You know, and 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 what what, what do they get from that? Everybody dies. Everybody is everybody's a loser in that, and uh, you know they. We could go on, uh, you know, uh, an authoritarian dictator who, who is, is they, they rise up against him, his, his fellows rise up against him and, and, and murder him for the good of the Republic. You know, they did Julius Caesar in uh, Central Park a few years ago. And who do you think the authoritarian dictator that got stabbed looked like? <laughs> I mean, there were there were Trumpists rushing the stage yeah. because you know they were they were they were telling a story of of this usurper, this this effectively uh, this person who was trying to destroy uh, 
democracy getting his, his comeuppance. But then the, those who destroyed him got their comeuppance as well. And it all, it all eventually turned to shit. Pardon my French. <laughs> but um, yeah, so Shakespeare's impossibly relevant today. And, and in fact, it's uh, it, in a way, it, in a way, it saddens me that that he continues to be relevant because I, I I would love it if if some of you know if Shakespeare was just you know just these charming period pieces that we could do and get some enjoyment out of. And well, here's a question. Yeah, um, I mean, you're actually bringing up something that. Um, uh, Clelia, who says hello to us, mm. uh, <laughs> just commented on, um, which is that um, uh, that you know, through your story, what you're just saying right now is that human beings haven't changed since Shakespeare's time. And she was asking, can we change? My question to you, you know, because the examples you're giving are showing that we're still struggling with the same thing, and therefore he is relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but then my question becomes, how can the engagement of Shakespeare in um, as we move forward, right, as we hopefully rebuild our, our collective understanding of what it is to live together, how can the performance and the study and the exploration of Shakespeare, you know, add to the, to the um, social renewal of our communities? I mean, that's a big question. I'm not asking you to solve the world, but I'm just would love your reflect your reflection on that. Like as, as a, as a participant, as an artistic participant in healing, where do you see Shakespeare uh, uh, connecting to us today? Well, you know, I, 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 I it's, it's on a, on a couple of different levels. I mean, of course, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Shakespeare not only shows us, you know, good and bad behaviors, but he also shows us the the consequences of those behaviors. So if, if we play out Shakespeare in its in his fullness and with passion, you know, it, it's kind of a very intricate and beautifully crafted and long Aesop's fable. You know, there's a moral to every story. There's um, the, the good are rewarded and, and the bad are, you know, cast away. So in, in witnessing these stories, you know, we, we sort of, we, we see, we're taught as, as children are taught by, by their elders that, uh, oh, this is good and this is not so good. However, on a, on a greater level, a more meta level, bringing people together to, in one place and time, to hear a story told or to see a story played out by players, doesn't even matter the level of skill of the players, but the idea of just gathering in a place and, and bearing witness to this event is in itself a, a healing uh, a healing thing. And I think the healing continues when after the play has come down, people are, maybe there's some people who are disturbed, maybe there's some people who are pleased, but conversation almost always breaks out after a after a good performance of Shakespeare. Uh, I think about all the times I've played at, at the Delacorte Theater in, in, in Central Park in New York. And at, at, after the show has come down, I just put on my civilian clothes and I'm walking out with the crowd. And you hear people really engaging over, oh my God, did you see that? What was that about? And And they're like, just just mumbling and talking and having a wonderful time all the way out to Central Park, to the streets, where then they retire to, to a pub or something, and, and, and the conversation continues. You know, it's not just a, it's not just going to see a play. It's, I think it's going to, to have ideas dropped on you, and you can't help but, uh, but respond to those ideas. A wonderful I, production. Go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say that I think that the um, the richness of his uh, language, but not just the language, but the what you've already been saying very eloquently, his thought, you know, and his insights. Mm -hmm. We that's what I wanted to say earlier. Mm -hmm. That um, we have dealt, we have relegated him 
to a place in our world, like a lot of our theater, right? For very wealthy, educated people in closed doors and big buildings, right? Mm -hmm. Not only, mm -hmm. I mean, there's certainly Shakespeare in parks mm -hmm. and all of this in schools, but the idea that it's sort of a, an elevated experience, it's, you have to be ready, you know? Mm -hmm. And I always feel that that's quite contradictory when, I mean, or it's contradicted when I think back to a friend of mine who was teaching in, um, in um, a very rough neighborhood in the Bronx, I think it was, I mean, a really rough school, uh, very sadly dangerous, you know, I mean, you had to go through a metal detector back then to get into the school. Mm -hmm. And she goes into this classroom and she is there as a teaching artist, so nobody's paying attention to her. And the teacher's like, oh good, I can go now and leaves. And so then they go crazy and they're mm -hmm. just, you know, back then everybody had, what were those things those that you put on, well, with Walkmans. So they're listening oh, yeah. to their Walkmans and they're like, you know, not paying attention and they're huddling and she thinks, what the heck am I gonna do? So she gets onto the table, opens up a Shakespeare book and starts screaming Shakespeare at the top of her lungs. And she's this petite little thing. And they all look at her first because she's the crazy teacher on the table, you know, mm -hmm. and then they start listening to her. And then they start listening to him. Mm -hmm. And then they start responding to what is actually being shared. And so from that experience, they reflected back on their own lives. And yeah. they're like, well, this happened to me and my sister did da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And they start talking about Shakespeare. They start talking about what gets opened up in them. And suddenly this room of chaos and disinterest is all focused, all directed. And we're not in a formal production anywhere. We're not, you know, we're not like in a regional theater with 500 seats of, you know, mm -hmm. we're just in a Bronx classroom where everybody had to check their guns before they came in and just, you know, some woman is screaming on the top of the teacher's desk. And right. then, relationships start to get built and possibility emerges. And so, you know, because I, I think that that's the question, you know, what you're talking about is so important that he, through the centuries, speaks to us about being a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have put him in a closet and do we need him now, but in a different way, you know? Well, personally, I, I'm not a big fan of what I call museum Shakespeare. Mm. I'm not, I've never been a big fan of that. Yeah. I'll give you another story to go along with the story you just told about what happened in the Bronx. I was with a Shakespeare company in Miami. Uh, it was an outdoor company, very, very rough and fun. And we did a special performance for high school kids from Liberty City, which is the, the toughest part of Miami. They also call it Overtown. You, you never ever want to, it has like an overpass and you never want to come down off that overpass and go into Overtown because you were going to have problems. So we played for these, these young people and um, they, were, they, we, they were wild and raucous when we got in. We were doing Taming of the Shrew. Ah. <laughs> and um, I'll tell you, no sooner does the battle of wits start between Kate and Petruchio, but that audience captured them, we got them. They loved it. They they loved the wordplay. They loved the language. They loved the feistiness of these two characters. And they continued to, to just really buy into the whole story. And I think what that what that tells us is that um that as much as as much as uh well moneyed regional theaters, you know, <laughs> with, a, with a, a particular demographic that, uh, yeah, we won't go there, but uh, well, money. Well, regional you theaters, can go there. It's okay. fine. I, 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 gosh, this is going to sound, this is going to, I, I've had it with, 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 with white people theater, you know, doing un, un, you know, un, challenging productions of plays that should be shaking people up because we don't want to we don't want to offend we don't want to offend the crowd you know I, mean? I, I i like my theater rough i like it challenging i like it maybe a little bit frightening and i think shakespeare's company liked it that way too um but 
Shakespeare only becomes museum Shakespeare if we make it that. It's it it's it's the nature of the material to be spoken out loud, uh, in person, uh, with with plenty of room for the audience to say something back. Uh, mm. When Mar when Mark Rylance first took when, when Mark Rylance first opened uh, the Globe Theater. It's a wonderful story. He, they were doing um, Henry V, and I think Mark was playing Henry. I forget now, but there's a scene where, where the French general, just before the Battle of Agincourt, begins to say, "Ah, and the, the English will run before us like dogs," and the people who were standing down front of the stage, they started saying, "Never, never," and the. The, the, the actor playing the French general was, oh, yes, you'll run like that. And this, oh, this dawning broke, broke out between the actor and the audience. You know, <laughs> and they were defending the honor of England, and he was calling them all. And that's pure theater. Yes. And that's Shakespeare. And um, so, yes, I mean, we, uh, I, I, I don't ever want to be in a production. And I've been in them, but I, I never ever again want to be in a production that doesn't have meat and blood and passion and challenge to it. And the more challenging, the more meaty, the more bloody, passionate, uh, spittle spewing Shakespeare is, the better. You know, you what you're saying um, ties very much into what we focus on. And, and I, I personally have for many years now uh, at the Global Theater Project and in all my work, which is that, that theater truly is an active relationship, right, between the audience and the artists, and mm -hmm. a, a active. And when it's passive, it really is a, a deadened experience, and it's a lost opportunity, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. For, for for really helping to wake um, our community members up to the complexities of being a human being. Mm -hmm. And I, I I personally believe right now that's the artists, particularly the theater artists' role. Sure. Uh, that should be taken on is to help other our, our neighbors um, mm -hmm. awaken to their capacity and to do that in a, a myriad of ways. And certainly that kind of high level engagement where everyone is awakened and engaged yeah. uh, is, is a communal experience that just for that moment, even if it's just one moment, the, the 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 cells of everybody's bodies are all sparking together you know yeah. i mean it's just uh it's an awesome power that's created by everyone and sort of initiated by the the the, the, the narrative of shakespeare's words mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um, and you brought something up miguel that i want to jump into unless you wanted mm. to say something else no i'm good carry on <laughs> Great, I'm out of ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, which you kind of implied, and I also want to uh, follow up on, which is um, uh, like this idea that Shakespeare, you know, what what the um, ethnicity of Shakespeare performers uh, can or cannot be, should or should not be, and and how that's been for you over your, if you've seen any difference or in any evolution of that concept from you know when we were young and first met until mm -hmm. you know now and where you think there might be still room for growth and evolution in order to keep him uh, his work relevant and important for our communities yeah well um elizabethans people in shakespeare's time they were i i think there was a there was and continues to be an element of racism you know however there was also the there was they, they were also they weren't all that insular. You know, they were they were it was a, a the the England at that time was a a great way, seafaring nation, a trading nation. So people from all over the world were finding their way to England, and Eng, the English were finding their way all over the world. So they knew something of the world, and they continued to do so. I think in terms of uh, putting. The, the 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 race and the ethnicities of, of different characters in Shakespeare, I, I, I think, especially in England, but all over the world, we're finding out that um, that it, it really doesn't matter. I think I think here in in the U.S., 
we, because of our, because of the ongoing struggle for, for racial justice, there, there are certain roles that are kind of off limits to, to actors, well, to, to actors who were white. I mean, I, I just, it was a long tradition that back in the 18th and 17th centuries that you know any actor could play any part in uh, Shakespeare, but it was mostly white actors. But I don't, I don't think uh, I don't think a white actor could play Othello in America and not get a lot of pushback and a lot of get a lot of trouble for that. And even though you know it, it's it's conceivable that you know it conceivable that I like somebody from. North Africa, like from Morocco or somebody from the Middle East could play Othello um, because that's actually, it's a wonderful picture of uh, the, the, uh, the Moorish ambassador to uh, the court of Queen Elizabeth. He was this tall man in a burnous and a turban. He was a Berber, but he was the Moorish ambassador. But, uh, but to that end, I, th I think, I think maybe there's, th Othello is one that would be problematic, but everything else I think is off limits. Well, I take that back. Aaron the Moor in uh, Titus Andronicus. What's interesting about that is they um, they made Aaron the Moor a Moor, a black Moor, and they also made him probably possibly one of the most evil characters in all of Shakespeare. And it was it was Elizabethan racism. Well, this this character is really going to be. It's got to be the most evil. How how can we make him most evil? Let's make him black, because the blacks, you know, they're all evil. So, um, but now you know he's he's an amazing character. But even though he was first played by a white man, that that's just not happening anymore. Um, I don't know. In my own experience, I've, you know, I've I've played. I played a lot of different characters in Shakespeare, and the fact that that I'm Latinx has never come into play. Although, in as I've come to I've come to an age where there's a little more retrospect, you know, I'm looking back, and I'm I'm seeing how maybe the fact that that I'm I'm not blonde haired and blue eyed may have had an effect in the roles I was accorded in my life, you know. But I'm not finished yet, so there, there's still yeah. there's still it seems time. To me, you're just time starting, to, Miguel. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> there's still time to correct that. Um, no, I I, I I think if you took a well, there was a, the the real challenge is in gender, but that's that's uh, that's being overcome. There was a great production of Taming of the Shrew, an all female production at, at Central Park, and. Um, Oh my God! It was just—it was glorious. I—I I can't remember the actress's name who played Petruchio. <laughs> she was brilliant, and the the taming scene, the love scenes between her and Katarina were were just passionate and funny. And what was interesting about a female playing Petruchio is that um, she had an objective view of masculinity. And what what are the what are the little you know little check marks of masculinity? And she hit all those little notes that that uh, that a male is just not objective enough to to see. And it was hilarious. This this hyper macho masculine Petruchio, played by a tall, slender woman, but she was she was a badass. <laughs> <laughs> And, but all the women in this company were just amazing. And, and all of them, especially the ones who were playing men, were playing men in, in a, in, in a hyper-masculine way that, that I think is comparable to, to the, um, the beautifully studied and executed femininity that we see uh, drag players uh, put into play on stage. Um, it was it, because it was just so beautifully observed and rendered in both cases so, that, uh, that you can't help but wonder at it. Yeah, there's two things that come to mind right now. One is that Lisa says that it was Janet McTeer. Yes, it was Janet. 
<laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> and the other is um, that what you're saying right now it kind of it moves very much into my second to last question, which is mm. uh, artistry. Mm. What for you, how would you, Miguel Perez, define artistry? I th artistry. Artistry is it's a, it's a twofold thing. It's um, artistry is achieved when when a, an artist masters their medium, and then um, and then sh shares what they make without fear. Uh, the 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 great singer songwriter uh, Joni Mitchell told a story about when when she met uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, and they're both watercolorists and they're both artists at the highest uh, level. But O'Keeffe wanted to meet Joni Mitchell because she said, you know, in my dreams. In my dreams, I've always wanted to be a soprano who sings high notes without fear. I, whether it's whether it's someone, you know, like my wife, the the, the artist Kay Freeman, who who goes into the studio and and puts paint on a canvas with such passion, and then when it's finished, it's like it is finished, and now the world can see it, and there's no going back. There's no there's no fear. She, this is the work, and uh, and people sometimes find it challenging. Some people people find it endearing. People find it frightening. When Pavarotti, even towards the end of his his career, would 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 would, would come to that that beautiful crashing high note at the close of Messendorma and hit it, and just give up to it, uh, that's artistry, you know. Even though there was a risk that he might not make it, he was willing to take that risk. Um, you know, the, when, a, when a musician, when a musician, a, mu a real high caliber musician has to practice every day, has to be continue. Uh, mastering an instrument like, like a violin or something is a, is a perishable skill and has to be refreshed every day. So that devotion, to, to craft, and then that's the other thing, uh, a high caliber classical musician, they, they cannot make a mistake. And so they have to go out and play absolutely on the edge of, of their ability to get the most out of the music, but also to take this, the, the biggest chance of, of making a mistake, of doing something wrong. So, yeah. Um... I don't want to interrupt you. Do you have it's, any? It's generosity and fearlessness. Generosity of spirit, and fearlessness in sharing. That's artistry. So, well, you said quite a a, a, a beautiful and eloquent definition of artistry. I, I mean, I was writing it down. Mm. A lot of what you had to say is just gorgeous. And I do. Um, mm. now, my question is: mm. Given that, I think that we we've, we've spoken pretty well to people who. Uh, may have performed Shakespeare in, or, you know, professional artists, you, you've given very, a lot of insights. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, are there, uh, I had asked you to consider two things. Um, you know, if you were addressing a professional peer, mm -hmm. is there any um, uh, thing that you'd want to share with them that deepened your understanding of working with Shakespeare? And I, I feel you may have, you, I mean, I would have thought you've tapped on, in on that, but if there's anything not yet that you want to add, then please do, and then I'll go to my final question. All right. Well, then one other thing, and this is something that I, I tell my students. Yeah. And I, I, it's like rule number one of Shakespeare. Never forget that the people in Shakespeare, the people who lived in Shakespeare's time, the English of Shakespeare's time, have more in common with the Sicilians of today than the English of today very passionate people who, if, if you insulted them, they would stab you. So let go of what we think it is to be an Englishman 
because in Shakespeare's time, it was a whole other thing. I love that. I love that. Hang on, hang on. Okay, that's it is fabulous. from my mother wit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my last question is, mm -hmm. uh, now we're talking uh, to people who are not professional artists, who have a quiet little voice in them that loves Shakespeare but doesn't know how to open that door. Mm. You know, what would you say to them? What key would you share with them that you know, in their own quiet way, they could start to tap into their personal artistry. Uh, uh, I was going to use Italian, my God, through Shakespeare. <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, the first thing I would invite them to do is um, watch Star Trek. Uh, there are so many of the Star Trek stories that are based on Shakespeare. There's, uh, Conscience of the King, which is, is based on uh, Hamlet. And there's the Elan of Troyes, which is based on uh, Taming of the Shrew. And th there's all kinds of great Shakespeare's. And there's moments that are, that are straight out of Shakespeare. So I would say start with that. Then maybe a little game of thrones and just sort of like, just live in all of that, that passion and wonder. And then when you're all alone and you've you've sampled all of this stuff, go just go to go online, go to you know MIT, they have all the Shakespeare online, and just take a chunk of text and in the privacy of your room, read it out loud. Just read it out loud. Shakespeare isn't literature, Shakespeare is theater, meant to be spoken out loud. Read it out loud. And you know, when you run into something, you're already at MIT, look it up and know it all. And then after you've had some fun reading it out loud, pick a scene and read it out loud with another friend who maybe has some interest. And once the two of you have done that, then get a group of friends and get a couple of bottles of wine and some food, sit in a circle and read a Shakespeare play out loud together. Or on Zoom. Or on Zoom, <laughs> yeah. For now. Get, get some food and wine and get on Zoom and read out loud together. You'll get more out of it that way than in listening to records or trying to read Shakespeare. Oh, reading Shakespeare is no fun at all. You have to speak it. Now, Miguel, when you say MIT. Yeah. Oh yeah, the uh, MIT.edu, uh, Shakespeare.mit.edu, Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Yeah. I, so is that Shakespeare.mit.edu or is it? Yeah, I think it is. Oh. Okay. Yeah, Shakespeare.mit.edu. Shakespeare.mit.edu. Yeah, and it's all there. The whole the whole canon. You okay. don't have to. You don't have to read it, or you don't have to buy a complete. But later on in the life, if you've read a few of these out loud, you might want to go a little deep, but uh, not necessary. I think that that was a beautiful entryway that you just gave to someone who, you know, in their heart <laughs> would like to try it, you know, and, and really, because I'll tell you why, from my point of view, from the Global Theater Project point of view, um, you're also talking about building community. Yeah, and and yeah. um, that is, you know, that's an awesome way to, uh, you know, first to have that personal first experience and then to venture out and find others to connect that to and mm -hmm. to then create something that is a benefit to the community, even in the most gentle of ways, um, mm -hmm. is really a beautiful thing. You know that I don't know this for a fact, but I'm with that good money that there are Shakespeare reading groups on meetup.com or something mm. like that. You know, it's probably not a hard thing to find. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and these are folks who just get a kick out of it. You know? Well, I'm really grateful for you to spend time with me on um, our first artistry module talking about. I don't, how do I, I don't know how I got into the artistry module. <laughs> 
I'm just a poor player. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? That's exactly who I wanted to talk to <laughs> because we are all pretty much poor players on this mm -hmm. stage of life. So, here, here. you know, let's just all celebrate that fact together. Um, so uh, I thank you so much, Miguel. You're and, entirely um, welcome. Yeah, yeah. It's so nice to spend time with you. Um, and then um, for those of you who are watching, thank you so much. And we'll see you again soon. And we have our uh, our upcoming project, Our Voice, Our Day, um, which is about our relationship to voting um, mm -hmm. and how to uh, look at the complex complexities, I should say, of what it means to vote, to be a voter, to be a citizen. And that's being driven and created by young artists uh, using the four pillars to build it over the next five months. So if anybody wants to get involved with that or send an 18 or 29 year old over to get involved with that, um, please write me. But um, right now I just wanna celebrate you, Miguel. I'm ah. really, really grateful. So grateful. My pleasure. My pleasure. Right. I love to talk. <laughs> I hear myself talk. It's great. I know, right? We're, I mean, I actually can feel my earplugs in my ears when I'm not wearing them now. It's such a horrible thing. Okay. So <laughs> we're going to end the broadcast and then um, I will see you again soon with whoever is going to be talking about an art form next in our artistry pillar. Bye. Bye. -bye.